Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on preparing teachers and nurses for virtuous practice, hosted by the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues at the University of Birmingham. Um, you're very, very welcome this afternoon, and thank you very much for joining us at uh, towards the end of what has been a very long term, after what has been a very long year. So thank you so much for giving up your time this afternoon to, to hear from us and our speakers. Um, we have three speakers for you this afternoon, um, talking from different aspects uh, to do with the education of teachers and the education of nurses, and then reflecting on um, how both of what our speakers, uh, key speakers will be saying, and then how that relates to the work of the Jubilee Centre for Character and Virtues. My name is Aidan Thompson. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives in the Jubilee Centre. And um, I'm very delighted to welcome our speakers to you. The format of today will be that we will run for just under one hour. We will stop at five o'clock. But before then, we have three speakers, as I say. First of all, we have Julie Taylor from the University of Warwick. We have Lorna Hollywood from the University of Birmingham. And we have my colleague, Andrew Mayle from the Jubilee Centre, who will be speaking in that order. So as I repeat again, some of the practicalities for today's event, if you can remain with your microphones muted and the cameras off, that would be great. Um, if you want to see the speakers, um, you can use uh, alternate between the speaker view and the gallery view, which is in the top right of the, of the Zoom screen. We are recording today's session and today's session will be circulated to all of those who have registered, but also will be placed on the Jubilee Centre's uh, website. We have a couple of other webinars lined up for after Easter in our series, some of which were mentioned in those opening slides, but details of those will be mentioned towards the end of today's session. So, um, the Jubilee Centre has looked at virtues in the professions for a number of years, actually since it launched in 2012. Along with, alongside our work in character education and teaching in schools, we've looked at the place and role of character in the training of professionals at universities, but also in CPD training once professionals move into practice. We have looked at particular professions, those of teachers, those of nurses, but also those of doctors, lawyers, the British Army, business professionals, and we're currently looking at the police, some of which will be reflected in what my colleague Andrew says later this afternoon. So what is the role of character in the professions? What we have found is that it is often the case that we find that character is absent when a particular profession or multiple professions suffer from scandals or suffer from particular um, negative uh, stories. And the question is always then around kind of why is character absent? Where is character in the training of that particular profession, such as MPs, such as banking, such as doctors and nurses. I think there isn't, there aren't very many professions that haven't suffered from scandals over in, in recent years that can be attributed perhaps to where character has not been present. But character is also present. It is not the case that these professions are wholly negative and that care and compassion, empathy, honesty, integrity are absent in the training and in the practice of those professions as the Jubilee Centre's research has found. Training for professionals often begins at undergraduate level or at postgraduate level. And we're going to hear about two professions today, those both public facing professions of teaching and nursing. Why we've selected these two professions uh, for this afternoon's webinar is that we see a lot of synergies between them and a lot of overlaps in terms of both the way the training takes place, but also what uh, the purpose of those professions really, really is and how professionals engage in those in their work. Virtuous practice in teaching and virtuous practice in nursing are quite similar. And we will hear from um, Julie and Lorna as we uh, as we progress through this afternoon's webinar. At this point, I will hand over to uh, our first speaker today, who is Julie Taylor from Warwick University. Julie leads the partnerships with primary and early years and also is a senior tutor at Warwick and the PGC course. We're also delighted that Julie is a graduate from our very own MA in character education. So, uh, and has embedded character within the ITE program at Warwick over a number of years. But at this point, I'll hand over to Julie to talk about the place of character in teacher training at Warwick. Over to you, Julie. Thank you very much, Aidan. Is it okay if I have my slides up, Joe? So um, thank you very much for that nice welcome. Um, it's lovely to be here to share some of the things that I've been learning over the last few years. As Aidan said, I was um, I've 
completed the MA last year, um, I graduated last year, and that's really taught me a lot of things about character education and what that really looks like in practice and given me so much opportunity to reflect on what I hoped I could embed within the work that I do at Warwick. Um, so our programmes are postgraduate, just to kind of put that into a context as well. So we, we train teachers in the space of a year, which is quite a challenge, as you might imagine. Um, so to try and kind of fit in lots of content from university alongside very heavily based school um, school based programs as well. Um, has been quite a challenge for us to really make the course in the way that we want to and really sort of embed the virtuous practice elements I'm going to be talking about today. So I um, just wanted to kind of put that into a context. So if I could have the first slide Job, that would be great. So I just wanted to talk, so I'm going to talk through in two different sections really. So first of all, why we decided at Warwick that there was a need for a focus on virtuous practice for our student teachers. And then I'll be talking about some of the actual things that we did that, that led from that. Um, so I'll talk about some of the things that we discussed as a team. I just want to reiterate this, is a, this has been a journey and is still an ongoing journey. It's certainly not a quick fix at all. Um, and it's something, it's quite difficult to make changes on university programs as well so we've had to kind of embed things over quite a few years but we, we feel we're making really good progress with it so I hope you can see some of the, the good things that we feel we're doing that we're happy to share with you. So the first thing that, that came to mind when we were discussing why we needed a focus on virtuous practice was about the societal expectations of teachers. Aidan's alluded to this really as well. There's very high expectations of teachers, of all professionals. Um, I've put that, a quote there from the Jubilee Centre to kind of sum that up really. I've certainly seen over the last few um, months and you know the last year, particularly during the COVID period as well, how people are very quick to judge teachers and have very high expectations of what they can consider teachers should be doing and how they should be behaving um, <clears throat> so we, <clears throat> excuse me so we recognized that that was something we really needed to consider when we were thinking about what we provide for our student teachers to prepare them for for the profession um, teachers certainly are seen as moral exemplars as well. So we, we've seen that in the work that we do with schools as well, that the, the, the pupils really look up to, to student teachers um, and obviously teachers in their profession later on as well, really viewed as moral role models. And everything that teachers do, their words, their actions, their body language, it's all picked up on by pupils and really kind of considered, and they really kind of dwell on that and really think about what that means to them and then sort of emulate what they see their teachers doing as well. Um, when I was doing my MA, I, I came across some research that showed that if uh, people see unethical practice from their teachers, that that can then be emulated as well. So obviously we want our teachers to be modelling really good ethical practice, so that can then be modelled by pupils as well. So we felt that we perhaps needed to be more explicit with making sure that our student teachers really embodied that, that they recognise that that's a really important part of their role and they have those ethical and moral responsibilities. We also spent quite a lot of time discussing and thinking about professionalism. On a lot of professional programmes, particularly in teaching, um, professionalism is considered to be more compliance rather than actually looking at professional behaviours. So we wanted to sort of rethink what we mean by professionalism. Um, and the teacher standards are there as a guide about what teachers should aspire to be achieving in their role. But actually, there's so much more to being a professional than just turning up on time, good attendance, wearing the right clothes, you know, all those kind of things. It's so much more than that. And when I started um, looking at other professions and the, the ethical guidance that's given to other professions, like medicine, for example, uh, teachers have a lot less guidance given to them regarding ethics. It briefly mentions ethical responsibilities in the teach standards in the preamble and part two, but it's very hidden, really. It's not really given much, much um, kind of uh, emphasis compared to some of the other standards. So we thought perhaps we need to do a little bit more looking at that um, and I'll talk to you about some of the things that we've done to really get students thinking about their professionalism what that looks like in terms of their professional behaviours so that was something else that we reflected on. Um, on as part of the MA um, there's a lot of work on the MA that, that talks about phrenesis which Aristotle uh, talked about in terms of practical wisdom and making the right decisions for, about the right, behaving in the right way at the right time for the right reason and that was something that really resonated with me 
idea is something that perhaps we could think about how we could develop that further with our student teachers. And for me, probably the most important thing of all of those is actually if we have flourishing teachers, then that can have an impact on our pupils and help them to flourish as well. Um, I think our most successful trainees over the years have been ones that not only have done really, really well in the classroom in terms of their technical ability, but they've also had such a positive influence on the whole child, that sort of holistic impact that they've had, that they've really developed the character of the children that they've taught. And also they've gone on quite a personal journey as well. I think there's so much more to teaching than just being you know good at teaching it, there's a lot more that comes with it um, and certainly when you think about kind of your favorite teachers and I certainly when I reflect back on the, the teachers that really inspired me over the years those were the ones that really had an impact on me as a person and I think um, the trainees kind of relate to that as well they really feel that actually the person they remember the teacher they remember was the person that was kind to them the person that was patient with them you know lots of kind of altruistic reasons as to why they remember the teacher that was stuck in their mind as being their favorite teacher and people tend to go into the profession for those reasons as well they go in because they want to make a difference um, I hear that all the time in interviews you know people really really want to make a difference to the children and to people's life chances and things as well so they're not often going in certainly to primary because they want to be an amazing maths teacher they tend to go in for more of those moral reasons as well so we were reflecting on that thinking you know are we doing enough of these things explicitly enough in our program um, and also it was interesting to read as well that there's there's often an absence of virtue-based content within professional programs as well certainly within teaching programs so actually we wanted to to try and do something about that and to make that more evident within our teaching training programs so that was our thought process um, if I could have the next slide Joe that would be great um, so these are some of the things that we've done over this is probably about the last four or five years I think so it has definitely been a journey so I put my little road in there to remind me to tell you all it's been quite a long journey so I think the key point that we were trying to do is to make the implicit more explicit I think we've always been quite good at Warwick at sort of really showcasing values and treating our students kindly and with compassion and expecting that from the students when they start teaching in school as well but when we thought about it are we really making those things explicit enough in our program so the first thing we started doing quite a long time ago now, um, was to start introducing some very specific character focused content within our programmes. Um, and I made some links to the Jubilee Centre before I started the MA. Um, Michael and Paul, who I think are both here today, um, have come and done some, some introductory lectures with our students, introducing character education. We did them really early, deliberately as well, because we wanted our students to be really aware of character right from the outset. Um, and it's so they it was kind of in their mind before they actually started on their school placements. We also now do a session at the end of the year as well to support them with their NQT year and we encourage them to get involved with the Jubilee Centre's CPD programme as well so that's a timetable slot for them to engage with with that as well. We've been involved in some research projects. We were part of the Character Perspectives of Student Teachers project quite a few years ago. Our 17-18 cohort, I think it was, were involved in that. And I encourage the students to come to events like this and really be a part of that character education community as well to, to really get them involved. Um, so that was one of the first things that we did. We then started having a look at professionalism because I raised that about something that we were sort of mulling over quite early on. And we really re redefined what we meant by professionalism. Um, we've done various things to do with this, but one of the things that changed quite early on was rather than doing a lecture style approach to professionalism, we did um, we did it in a workshop instead. So with personal tutors in quite a safe space with, with people that the students knew really well, they had the opportunity to look at some ethical dilemmas and to really explore things that they might come across in school. So they're real life authentic dilemmas that actually happen to other students and just give the students a chance to unpick them. I use an ethical framework by um, a character educationist called Nancy Freeman. So we've kind of broke down um, a dilemma and really got the students to re-explore really what that dilemma, how it might play out, who's involved in it, who the stakeholders are, what, um, how they might respond in different situations and things as well. So right from the first week, they're starting to really think about behaving in kind of an ethical way. Um, and they found those really useful and it helps to kind of really emphasize those moral responsibilities of being a teacher. 
Um, some of the resources that we've gone on to use were actually created as part of a project with the medical school at Warwick. Um, so it's interesting being part of this as well, because we certainly noticed quite a lot of similarities between the two disciplines. Um, and we produced some resources that are used across both departments now as well, which will link to professionalism and how to respond to different situations as well, just to give the students a bit more guidance than they would have normally from just kind of referring to the teacher standards, which doesn't support them with things like that. Um, so that was something else that we've been working on and that's something I think that's that's still evolving um, in our recent reflection session students brought with them uh, a, something that they had they challenged their values from school and then they brought that to a, um, a session and they discussed it with their peers as well so we're, they're bringing some real life examples now they've got some more experience as well it can be quite difficult to reflect on a situation that you haven't been involved in yourself so we wanted them to bring some that they'd actually experienced too um, we also then uh, have quite a recent um, uh, initiative that we've been working on is we've developed some values that are specific to our department. So we've got three values um, which are social justice, intellectual curiosity and creativity um, and we've embedded those within a framework. So Joe, if you wouldn't mind just flicking onto the next slide briefly I can just show people what this looks like. So this is something we created this year which we've, we've adapted from the Jubilee Centre's framework and we've got our teacher values at the top and we've also then got the building blocks of, of um, character which the, the virtues are sorted into across the middle um, and we're hoping that by the students really engaging with those that they, that will help them to develop this practical wisdom phrenesis and be able to make different decisions um, about how they should behave in certain situations and if they, they really feel comfortable with that that can really have a very positive impact on them as teachers and also on the students that they, they work with as well. So this is in the students training plan and they have opportunities to reflect on their virtue, their own virtues, as well as the virtues of um, encouraging the virtues of the students that they teach as well. And we just think that's a really, really important part of what we do. Professional identity is so important and really embodying the kind of values that you want to hold then shape the kind of teacher that you want to be as well. So we provide lots of opportunities for the students to really reflect on themselves and their own values and their personal virtues. They do that with us in university in structured sessions. They also do that in school with their mentors as well. Um, if you wouldn't mind going back, Joe, to the previous slide, that would be great. So just to kind of reiterate the bit at the bottom then, so they have regular opportunities, critical reflection, both independent and structured and guided. Guided. They do an e-portfolio where they have opportunities to reflect independently and then they have opportunities to reflect with us and we encourage them to reflect regularly in school and really think about the virtues that they put into practice that week and how that's had an impact on what they've done in terms of being a teacher. We also advocate an ethical mentoring approach um, where we encourage our mentors to embody the values from the framework as well um, and I would say that's an ongoing <laughs> area because they're in school so often I think one of our next challenges certainly with me with my partnership hat on as well is to ensure that what we're doing in university is really supported by what's happening in schools as well because they are in school for such a significant proportion of time as well so those are some of the things that we've been working on um, it's certainly an ongoing process but we've certainly seen the students really engaging with it they've been very interested in character they they want to kind of embody these things and really show that they're making progress personally as well as professionally so I've been really pleased to see how it's been received and I think in terms of what we're working on next it's certainly how we can ensure that that's kind of embodied within the partnership more generally um, and to also consider how we can perhaps build in some of the virtues within some of our subject sessions as well because that's a, an area I'm keen to sort of develop especially after seeing last week's web webinar as well about the arts that inspired me to think how we can build them within our subject areas as well so I hope that was a useful summary <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions later thank you thanks Julie um, that was great I mean we, we've worked at, with you as you've alluded to some of the partnership work that we've done with IT at Warwick over the years, but it's great to, to hear from you how embedded that is and the, the journey that you've been on. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask all of our speakers questions 
after after they've all spoken um please do use the chat to post any questions to any or all of our speakers and we will turn to those after the three presentations um next is uh, i'd like to introduce lorna hollywood who is a registered adult nurse and also lecturer in the school of nursing at the university of birmingham lorna teaches on a variety of nursing modules on the pre-registration program which include public health long-term conditions palliative and end-of-life care um, Lorna recently contributed to a publication um, talking about bringing character to life, um, virtues in nursing, which my colleague Andrew will, will speak about shortly. But uh, I'd like to hand over to Lorna to talk about uh, virtuous practice in nursing. Lorna. Thank you, Aidan. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my slides. And if someone could confirm for me, they can see those. Thank you. That's lovely. Okay, so thank you so much for having me. So yes, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we do in the pre-registration programme to help prepare our nurses for virtuous practice. And um, coming at it from a, we're, I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective from Julie in that. Um, there is some really clear, explicit frameworks within Julie's programme um, to embed um, character virtues within her programme. And I'm, I'm much newer to this area of practice and actually um, you, um, thinking about character virtues as a separate entity to nursing. And so when I first had conversations with um, Aidan and Andrew and Judy about um, how we embed it within our programme, my first thought was, oh gosh, do we? Um, I, you know, where does that sit? Um, and when I started exploring the programme in a bit more depth and speaking to colleagues, I realised that it's implicitly embedded throughout the programme, which was really pleasing. Um, and, um, it, it, you know, it is all sitting there as we prepare our nurses to go into practice. And this has been a really useful exercise for me to think about um, how we do fit those into a, a more explicit framework in the future. So thinking about virtues in nursing, um, it was no surprise when I was introduced to some of the Jubilee Centre's research from a couple of years ago that nurses were ranking kindness, honesty, fairness as the top character virtues for, for the profession. And that's really, um, that's, that's clear from my clinical experience, it's clear from my teaching experience, and it's certainly embedded in the values of the NHS and um, the Code of Professional Conduct for Nurses. Um, we have the six C's in nurses, which people are, are often familiar with, um, which the image shows you there, um, which is all about developing a, a culture of compassionate care. And compassion is, is really all about demonstrating intelligent kindness and is really central to how people in receipt of our care perceive it, how they, how they receive and perceive it. Um, so there was no surprises there for me. Um, and I think that most people, I think Aidan alluded to this at the beginning, are familiar with um, some of the severe and devastating consequences when character virtues such as compassion, honesty um, and justice are absent from nursing um, and absent from the health services in which we contribute. And unfortunately, um, I think most of us are really familiar with headlines such as these that I'm showing you now. Um, the well-publicised history of um, the, the scandal at Midstaffs, which was an NHS trust, um, which had high mortality rates and lots of evidence of poor patient care. And later on, we had the scandal at Winterbourne View, where people with learning disabilities um, were found to be criminally abused, and that resulted in, in people being um, con um, criminal convictions. And... Um, out of the um, significant amount of serious case reports and public inquiries into these, um, um, the lack of virtues was, def was definitely a contributing factor right across from leadership to care delivery. So I'm not going to focus too much on that side of it, um, but what, what it has done is highlight and provide support for nurses um, and educators in the fact that compassion really is now embedded in policies that underpin our practice. Um, in all of these um, reports um, and the NHS constitution as well, there are um, clear examples of compassion um, 
respect, dignity and character virtues in practice. The NHS constitution aims to provide high quality care and it states that compassion and care should be at the core of how patients and staff are treated. Um, because not only are patient safety and experience and outcomes improved, but when staff feel valued and empowered, they perform better and are able to provide more compassionate care themselves. Um, I won't go through all of them, but the Francis report um, also um, acknowledged that effective services had to come from people who have the ability and capacity to provide caring and compassionate care and suggested we needed to have an increased focus on what are the practical requirements for us to be able to deliver compassionate care. Um, and one of the things that we find in nursing is that um, teams and individuals are really good at articulating how to care and how to be compassionate towards those in receipt of their care to our patients. But I definitely think we lack in directing that same care and compassion to us as professionals. And without us be, you know, feeling safe and cared about, it's really difficult. It's very quick to um, diminish your capacity to care in a compassionate way. Um, some of the other reports there, um, Card Truths actually put money where their mouth was and said that we needed more investment in nursing and midwifery leadership programmes. And that was um, all around compassionate leadership and um, the Cavendish, Cavendish Review, which focused on healthcare assistance. So, um, you know, a significant part of our teams um, really focused on the fact that in order to get, provide good care, um, people needed time and space to provide that care. Um, and in order to identify those things, like where do people need to have time and space, you need to be able to talk to people and identify where that's needed. So it begs the question, can care and compassion be taught? This, is, this would be a webinar in itself. Um, it's a great debate um, and I'm not going to um, bring this debate. I don't have time as much as I'm passionate about it. I don't have time to really examine this date, debate today. Um, but I did look to the literature, um, identified a review published two years ago in the Journal of Advanced Nursing and um, they proposed a framework for fostering compassion in nursing students identifying the need for us to be able to really clearly define what we mean by compassion in practice and to identify what that feels like from a patient's perspective, um, to look to our co-professionals um, and take an interdis interdisciplinary approach to fostering compassion um, and to integrate compassionate care into our clinical learning outcomes so that students are um, it, 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 it forms part of the assessment, it, it forms what their, their aims are on the programme. And another key part of it was um, to facilitate reflective practice. And the answer to that question was really summed up nicely in this literature review, saying that it is a virtue that can be potentially strengthened and cultivated through training, which is something we certainly try to do in the School of Nursing um, that I'm part of. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our pre-registration pre nursing programme at the University of Birmingham. Um, as um, with all nursing programmes across the country, we've all been subject to new educational standards that came out just um, in 2019, set by the Nursing and Midwifery Council, which led to a complete restructuring and development of a new curriculum. And it was a fantastic opportunity for us as educators um, to really look at the programme content and think about um, how we would how, how virtue is fostered in, a, in, in nurse education and how we prepare students to go out and be able to deliver compassionate care and compassionate leadership for each other. So here are some of the things, just a summary of some of the things that we do when I looked at the programme, just looking at it from a virtue, a character virtue perspective. Um, that really stood out for me. Well, we start at the beginning and we use a values-based recruitment strategy, which is informed by service users who we work closely with, with our public engagement in nursing team. Um, and as part of that, we um, ask students to start to identify some of the virtues that sit within the six C's of practice. Um, we also ask them to demonstrate to us or ex explain to us um, um, a, a, a to link a personal experience where they've demonstrated some of those values. So before they even come through the door, they're starting to articulate what character virtues are. Um, we have really strong theory and practice links. 50% um, of our programme, so 50% of the learning is undertaken in clinical practice as part of NHS teams. And um, lots of um, the work we do to bring those 
the, to bring the theory and practice together is to get students to be able to identify skills that they see um, and not just the clinical and technical skills that they see, but some of those fundamental um, basic nursing caring skills that they see. Um, and we also provide them with opportunities to practice those skills in, a, in the university setting. So we do that in clinical simulation and um, and also, um, you know, set it, I mean, obviously at the moment, lots of virtual opportunities to practice those skills as well. Um, we, um, we have a personal academic tutor role. So we provide a lot of support to our students from a pastoral um, perspective. That's changed due to the impact of the pandemic as we anticipate that students may, um, well, are experiencing significant difficulties in their own lives as, as they've coped with a year of isolation, lockdown and um, not being able to join the university and join the student community as they would in other ways. So we meet with our students every week and develop relationships with them um, and try to support them and um, to articulate when they're struggling um, and help them um, identify strategies to look after themselves. Um, professionalism is a key component of the programme. We're guided, like the teachers, by our code of professional practice. And again, that code really does focus on some of the, the, the rules of nursing and um, the policies that, that, that we have to adhere to. Um, but also within that professionalism is how to have um, professional relationships with patients, therapeutic relationships, in which we can build upon to um, be able to provide care for people. Um, our assessment and teaching incorporates um, lots of use of ethical dilemmas, so another parallel there with some of the, the things that Julie's just shared with us. Um, we do, we use in, interprofessional education um, to do an, um, eth ethical dilemmas, so students get an opportunity to work with other students who are, who they'll be working with in the future from social care, from physio, from um, medicine um, and other professions so that they're able to work through these dilemmas again in a safe space where they can use discussion and collaboration and we also incorporate the use of ethical principles to help students develop that and that's incorporated in lots of elements of their assessments as well so that they can start to really apply those ethical pr decision making principles um, to their clinical practice and clinical decision making and that's a theme that runs all the way through from year one till the end of their program. Um, there is a strong, um, we know that reflective practice, and I don't think Aidan will perhaps go on to this, but we know that, um, Andrew, sorry, um, a reflective practice helps to, um, um, helps to develop um, character virtues. Reflective practice is embedded from the beginning of the programme and um, we get students to reflect on their own learning, to reflect on their own development and when they go out into clinical practice as part of their, um, their uh, practice assessment documents, they have to engage in reflective, written reflective practice as well. So we introduce them to models um, that can support them um, in, in developing those skills of critical reflection. Um, critical reflection is also a significant part of clinical supervision, which is what is it, which is when clinicians in practice um, use reflection to help them understand and make sense of things that have happened in practice. And clinical supervision has been known to support um, nurses in looking after their own mental health, helping them with decision making and helping them um, to direct their own learning. And so we're hoping that by embedding those skills early on, students will then go out when they're qualified professionals and take that clinical supervision role um, and, and um, apply it when they're out in practice. It is an area that needs developing in the NHS. There's often not time for clinical supervision, but we know that um, spending time on clinical supervision helps develop teams that can support each other. It helps develop relationships and helps identify problems early on. Um, we, um, we do teaching around emotional intelligence and self-awareness. Um, and we're also now applying um, coaching models where students are engaged in supporting, mentoring and teaching and um, helping each other. Um, and that, that ranges from um, third year students supporting in clinical skills education for year one students, um, and it goes out into the practice area as well. And I just thought I'd tell you briefly about some of the more specific educational interventions that, we, that we're doing um, on the programme at the moment, which um, when, when I examined them in a bit more depth, realised that actually, yes, these really do focus on developing 
um, and helping to identify character virtues in the profession. So we partner clinical skills education with virtues development a lot. So um, an example of this will be, we do, we're doing lots of e-learning at the moment as we adapt to learning in a virtual environment and coping with social distancing. So an example of that in our essential nursing care module in year one is that students um, have to go and do some e-learning around some of the essentials in care, looking at things like nutrition and hydration in older people, things like bladder incontinence and infection prevention and control. And they're learning that alongside doing programmes in compassionate care and cultural competence. And then when we bring them into the skills labs um, and when we do scenario work with the students, we give them scenarios that where they can practice their clinical expertise and skills, but they can also pull, pull that together with some of the virtue um, development that they've learned. We get students to self-assess themselves on character strengths. We get early service user engagement before they go into clinical practice where they get real life feedback on their communication skills, their abilities to establish a rapport and their ability to demonstrate that they care about somebody. We were doing that this morning with our year ones. Um, and we also put a focus on developing the skills to self-care, so recognising when uh, mental health distress, looking after, each, look, look, looking after themselves from a physical um, perspective, getting enough sleep, eating correctly, um, being able to take time out to exercise, meditate, whatever it is they need to keep themselves healthy whilst they're in clinical practice. I'll just finish now on thinking about some of the challenges ahead for us at the moment. I can't not talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the NHS workforce and on nurses in particular. The image in front of you is a really lovely um, image that came out early on in the pandemic as, as uh, there was a great public interest in the nursing role and recognising that nurses um, had stood up to the challenge of the pandemic. Um, but for me, this is a much more realistic artistic impression of what's happening to nurses out in practice. They're holding up the NHS. I speak with colleagues regularly about the impact of the pandemic. And my concern is that the, um, the, the level of PTSD that we're seeing, the level of trauma that we're seeing in nurses um, as they um, emerge from this pandemic is going to impact on their ability to provide compassionate care if they're not really, really well looked after. And this for me is, um, is, is definitely the biggest, um, the biggest battle. They've seen staff shortages, a depleted service, um, de depleted services, fear of a third wave, um, untold loss and grief. Um, and this concerns me about their ability to move forward um, from this. Lots of support is going to be needed so that we can continue to provide the compassionate care that we do. I've said it before, I said it in our publication, but you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, and so it's just really paramount for me at the moment that we send our students out well, healthy, happy, and that they feel and that they know that our, their educators care passionately about them um, and that they can go out um, and be able to share um, to share that care to their patients and to their colleagues because it's needed, it's needed more than ever. Um, the future of first in nurse education is definitely to continue this focus on um, character virtues and for me I would really like to see it made much more explicit um, than as implicit as I felt it has been um, and I'll certainly be looking at Julie's framework and thinking about how we might adopt something or adapt something similar um, for our programme. Thanks, Lorna. Thank um, I think there what, what we've heard is um, uh, two different stories, not just from two different professions, but where Julie is talking about uh, the framework that has been embedded in ITE at Warwick, which is a little bit more advanced, um, advanced or progressed and a little bit more embedded. But then what Lorna has reflected on there, which is a bit more implicit and a little bit more at its um, early stages, but still huge crossovers in terms of the, the character focus of the training of both uh, nurses and teachers. Um, I'd like to introduce now my colleague Andrew Mayo, who is a research fellow in the Jubilee Centre. Andrew joined us um, last year, in June 2020, and uh, is currently working on um, a virtue in policing project, um, but also has a background of working um, with professionals and in this sort of space. So I'd like to introduce Andrew to offer some reflections, but also to talk about some of the Jubilee Centre's work in this area as well. Lovely, thank you, Aidan, and um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, it is an absolute privilege for me to be able to talk to you after our two fantastic presentations from 
Julie and Lorna. Um, and it is wonderful sort of seeing the parallels that, that are drawn between the two professions. I think, um, as Lorna mentioned towards the end of her presentation, what I mean, if any professions are at the forefront of people's minds during this very challenging time that we've been through, it's definitely teaching and nursing. And, and I think it's wonderful. Um, of course, as Lorna mentioned, there have been huge challenges and for teachers, it's exactly the same, but it's wonderful to see the due um, attention and, and due credit that they're receiving. And so it's been really interesting to hear from, from both of you. Thank you. There are a few um, elements that really struck me. And I think that particularly um, as Julie mentioned quite early on in her presentation is, is the role of moral exemplars. Um, and that's something that we've really focused on a lot in our professions work um, at the Jubilee Centre. And it's so interesting to see how um, for both professions, it can be a really positive experience um, during one's formative years that then enables one to look towards that profession as a vocation and a calling and something that they want to um, live up to. And, and so the moral exemplars um, right from early on in childhood, but also during that training phase, I think is really interesting. And I think that's something that we at the Jubilee Centre have definitely um, noticed is that the more uh, relevant and realistic that moral exemplar is, the more able um, and the, the more able the student is for emulation. And so that's really, really interesting. And, and thank you both for highlighting that. And then, of course, I mean, what could be said um, about the, making the implicit explicit? And I think that's something that is really, really important. It's something that we've noticed across our work at the Jubilee Center. And um, it really, it, it really, um, obviously, as Julie said, it, it takes time. It's a journey, um, and and it takes uh, it, it takes effort. And, and as Lorna emphasised, you know, some of these things are actually around, but maybe we just haven't highlighted them enough, like the six C's of nursing. And that's something that we're looking at quite um, prominently in the Jubilee Centre. Um, and that came with a recent publication um, on the framework for character education in universities. Um, so we really are looking at the role that universities can provide in um, character education and uh, preparing professionals for virtuous practice. Um, just a few other things that, that were quite striking was the use of ethical dilemmas. Um, I loved what Julie had to say about how these are from students' lived experiences um, from their placements. And that's definitely a wonderful combination of reflection and working through ethical dilemmas. And I think that's something that can be learned across the board for, for professional um, preparing professionals for virtuous practice. It's definitely something that we use a lot in our own research. So um, in our professions research, we actually will focus a lot on ethical dilemmas. And we're very interested in, in the use of ethical dilemmas, or perhaps more correctly to use a term like quandary or um, very challenging situations um, in terms of pedagogical practices for, for the cultivation of virtues. And um, yes, sort of on that note, as, as, as Lorna mentioned, the role of reflection, I really like how, how reflection features in both of these uh, presentations as a very important way of, um, of cultivating virtues and, and just creating reflective practice. Um, and this leads me to um, a brief discussion on our professions work in general, um, which, oh, give me, I've just shared the wrong screen. There we go, that's more like it. Um, and I mean, the immense privilege I have to, to continue this work that has been um, occurring at the Jubilee Centre for a number of years, um, which has, as Aidan mentioned, focused on a variety of professions, um, including doctors, nurses, teachers, lawyers, um, finance and business professionals, um, as well as uh, the British military. And of course, we're very excited about the inclusion of policing in this, which is the most recent um, occupation to go through the professionalization agenda. And that's very interesting drawing parallels with teaching and nursing, who are also sort of relatively new kids on the block and, and, and have gone through that professionalization agenda. And there's a lot, a lot of parallels um, to be learned. 
And one thing that we did with the work that we've done on uh, looking at professional virtues is we created, we, we drew from our research and, and other publications and we created an infographic series called Bringing Character to Life. Uh, we've published one for each of the professions that we've worked with so far. And these are um, essentially practical, practical application manuals for those um, both studying and um, engaging in the practice of, of the profession. And I would just like to highlight those to you um, because they're packed full of really, really interesting information and, and sort of just wanted to draw a few um, highlights from those, particularly um, related to teaching and nursing. And that is, well, from all the professions, the most prominent virtue um, was that of honesty. Um, and so that was across the board. Uh, colleagues of ours did a, a meta-analysis of all the professions, and that was revealed as, as the top virtue. Um, and then more specifically, as Lorna mentioned, kindness and, um, and fairness were, were revealed as, as virtues within, within um, teaching and within nursing. And, and it's just really interesting to see sort of how those two, two complement one another. Um, and then to speak very briefly about the work that we're doing at the moment, um, we are, uh, Aidan, myself and our, our colleague, uh, Professor Christian Christensen, are working on a virtues and policing project, uh, which, as I mentioned, is the most recent occupation to, to go through a professionalization agenda. Um, and we're looking, we're working uh, with uh, students, with universities and with police forces at the role of character and virtues. And we also actually very exciting. I was very excited when, when Julie mentioned phrenesis and practical wisdom, because that is something that we're going to develop on in our project. And so the second phase of our, our research project is going to look at how that might be cultivated. And we're very excited to see how this might be applied in uh, across the professions. Um, so yes, just to say a huge thank you once again, and, and uh, what a privilege it has been to hear from you all. And I think I will hand over to Aidan, and we're now going to um, do some Q&A. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you again to Julia and Lorna. Um, yes, we do have some time now to, to ask questions of our speakers, whether that's um, from a, an educational pedagogical perspective, if you might be educators um, in this space, or if you are students in this space, whether this is something that rings true to you and your experience, um, whether that be at Warwick or Birmingham or another university. Um, so if you do have any questions, if you could post them in the chat, uh, just whilst we're waiting for some of those uh, to come through, I've got a question for, for Julie and for Lorna uh, to kick things off. Um, so Andrew's referenced this already, but Julie talked about moral exemplars. And there is an expectation that we place on teachers to be character educators or to be moral exemplars in front of the, the pupils that they uh, have in their care in the classroom. Um, do you think, Lorna, first of all, do you think that we can place that same level of expectation on nurses that seems to be uh, implicit for teachers to be moral exemplars, particularly in terms of care and compassion um, when they are practicing? Um, and also to, uh, to Julie, how do you find that student teachers um, respond to kind of being challenged or being expected to that expectation to be moral exemplars? Oh, that's a big question. Um, it's, I think there is an expectation. I think there is um, definitely an expectation that um, nurses can be held up as moral exemplars. And it's something that we debate actually on the course. We talk about, um, you know, our duty to be role models um, and, and certainly in terms of character virtues, but also our sort of behaviour, um, our lifestyle behaviour as well. And it's something that we do talk about and it's something that is alluded to within our code of conduct as well. Um, but it's a contentious area because we are professionals and we go to work to do a professional job and then we come home and we're somebody else. We're all, you know, we're all individuals. But in terms of care and compassion, I don't, I think that, um, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a just expectation that we are moral exemplars in practice, absolutely. Um, and I think we've got, I think educators and clinicians have a real responsibility to demonstrate care and compassion to each other, as well as to their, um, to their patients. Thanks Lorna. Yes, there's definitely a tension in all of the professions that we've studied between professional character and personal character. Um, which is reflected in some of the data we've collected. Uh, Julie. 
Um, I think for the majority of our students, they kind of expect that they are going to be moral exemplars anyway. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, they come to the course for moral reasons, really, because they want to make a difference. And so they're they they just expect to be like that and they're, they're they're actually i think they're quite surprised the influence they have on children very quickly actually from, from the minute they start their placement as well that the children really look up to them so i think that's a bit of a revelation for some of them actually to what extent they're an exemplar um but i think on on the whole the the students really do embrace that um and i think also they're they're very because we we character is such a, an important part of our programs now as well they're they're very sensitive to when they see colleagues in school not behaving as a moral exemplar as well and so they're, they're very aware of that now and they can pick up on it and that can make them feel quite uncomfortable because they've decided what kind of teacher they want to be and they want to be a virtuous practitioner and then if they see people responding in different ways in school perhaps talking for example about a child in perhaps a, quite a negative way that sits really uncomfortably with them as well so I think it certainly made them very aware of that responsibility I think they they always kind of knew it but I think because we talk about it so much now it's really become you know just part and parcel of who they are and the kind of teacher that they want to be so thanks Julie um there's a question from Maureen which is asking the framework that you referenced by Nancy Freeman would it yes. be possible to, I, to share I have, that I've just looked it up because I couldn't remember so it's it's called the systematic reflective case debriefing method and it's from Freeman 1999 um I can I'll have a look and see if I can find more detail about that but I've just found the slides that we use in induction week so I'll put that in the chat box because that was a lot to remember <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Um, we've had a, a few questions coming through. So if I ask two of them um, at once and then uh, see how our speakers would like to, to reflect on them. So a question from Carmelita, how would you challenge a student who is not showing virtuous character, even from the very beginning of the, the learning process? Um, offer that to, to Julie and to Lorna, I'm conscious to include Andrew in the questions as well. Um, so another question from Des, which is, what is a virtuous response that profession, for professionals when faced by some non-virtuous facets of either the health or education systems? Um, we've only got about five minutes left, but if, uh, invite all three of you to, to offer responses to a couple of those questions. I think um, with students who are demonstrating, um, I'll just go back to the question here, um, how would you challenge a student not showing the virtual any virtual character from the start of the learning process? Um, is always it as a, is always an uncomfortable thing to do, um, but something that we we do have to do. And my I'll just answer briefly. Always on a one to one. Always giving a student an opportunity to reflect on what that behaviour might have been, and always in a supportive way. It is normally a symptom of something else that we can um, open up a discussion about and hopefully help with. Yeah, I'd second that <laughs> very much so. Um, we, we give the opportunity for the student to really reflect. Sometimes they can't see it, I think, from themselves as well. So we encourage them to reflect from different people's perspectives as well. So rather than just them thinking about themselves and how they come across. Because some of our students come never had any school experience really until they start the PGCE. So they're just not necessarily used to how they need to behave in that kind of way in school. So we would we'd encourage them to reflect on things. We we use um, Brookfield's lenses quite a lot. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but we look, we encourage the students to look at um, how a different situation is, is considered from the student's perspective or from, you know, from the teacher's perspective or the senior leader's perspective. So they're sort of coming outside themselves and really thinking about things from different viewpoints. That can be helpful because I think sometimes they get very much caught up with themselves and what they're trying to achieve. Um, so that can be quite a useful way of approaching things too. But we're, you know, we, we wouldn't be comfortable letting a student kind of continue into the profession if we weren't absolutely sure that they were going to embody sort of the moral values we would expect from them so we'd have to have some quite stern conversations I think if things didn't change I'm just having a look at Des's question Des is my boss so I think he's just trying to <laughs> trying to challenge us here <laughs> um I've I've got a response yeah. for Des while, while you while you put your thinking cap on Judy <laughs> Although I didn't know, I didn't know your boss. Um, so Des, thank you very much for the question. And it, it is an important question and really valuable. And I think that we found in the research, which is published in those um, Bringing Character to Life infographic series that I mentioned, um, is that there are definitely going to be elements of the profession where virtues are challenged and, and 
it, it makes it difficult. For example, when there's extreme time pressure or when there, there's um, sort of more, more of a focus on instrumental outcomes or incredibly challenging workloads, which are evident in both of these professions, nursing and teaching. And so sort of what we, we tend to identify in the research is that it's really important that those challenges and those barriers are recognized and also then to focus on positive ways of, of dealing with them. For example, um, as is evident in, in both of these professions, having supportive colleagues is, is crucial. Um, and ways of achieving that could be through um, creating mentoring systems, having leadership, you know, leaders in the, in the profession sort of setting the example and being um, exemplars themselves. And then also a, a key aspect is really that virtues, um, of course, in, in both of these professions are, can be displayed and, and that will both enrich the experience of, for example, the student or the patient, but it will also um, be enriching for, for the individual professional. And, and that is key at, at the Jubilee Centre is that virtues are the result of, of, of virtues in a virtuous life and uh, virtues in the profession is, is flourishing. And it's flourishing both in the organisation and for the individual professional. Thanks, Andrew. Julia, give you an opportunity to respond to your boss if there's anything you wanted to add to that. <laughs> um, I completely agree with everything that Andrew was saying. I think we encourage, because we, we have social justice as something that's re we really um, kind of is important to us, as well as a department. We want students to, to kind of challenge things that they see that they don't agree with. It's very hard as a student teacher. I completely recognise that. You know, you feel very small fish in a big pond, don't you, when you're in school as a student. But we do want them to be the people that go into school and to get change and actually sometimes the system isn't how we want it to be um, so actually the student teachers going into schools you know as NQTs, RQTs and in their future career can really be the people that make the change I think and challenge this kind of um, less ethical practice mm -hmm. that, that does happen in schools on occasion. Thanks Julie and thanks Lorna I think you've actually just touched on an answer to our colleague Michael Fullard's question which in terms of seeing a difference as uh, students going but advocating your students and empowering your students to to make a change despite them being student teachers or NQTs or RQTs and I would expect the same uh, maybe in nursing um, with Lorna students when they could do their placements and go into practice as well. Um, Conscious it's five o'clock and I did say we finish on time uh, very quickly respond to uh, Dee Wright's question about how we can build on this. I would encourage you to look at the Jubilee Centre's CPD offer, which is completely free um, and looks at empowering and equipping a lead for character in schools, which is intended there where a school um, is passionate about making more explicit their character focus um, to, to equip um, somebody uh, to, to lead that in the school in different ways. And we, we draw on different schools from around the country, from different backgrounds and how they've gone about doing that. Because I think it's important. I think what we've heard and the similarities and the synergies between nursing and uh, teaching and the training of those professionals here. But there is no one way to do this. There is no blueprint for developing the virtuous professional um, or indeed uh, being virtuous in our practice. But thank you very much to Laura, to Julie and to Andrew and to all of you. For joining us this afternoon um there is uh, a webinar series there are two more lined up that we have uh, forthcoming after easter uh, if you want to follow us uh, check it out on twitter or on our eventbrite page but thank you very much for your time this afternoon and uh, have a good evening <laughs>